My name is Donny O'Rourke. I was head of arts at Scottish Television in 1990 when I produced and directed and presented a film to mark Edwin Morgan's 70th birthday. He taught me at university. He was my poetic mentor. We became very close friends and much in his oeuvre has inspired not only my writing, but my way of being in the world. His was a transformative presence. And the film, I'm afraid, in many ways is deficient. It wasn't a low budget venture. It was a no budget film. And my colleagues who worked with me on other programs donated their time to enable us to make this little documentary about a truly great poet. It seems a little unusual um, that you found your voice at a, for a poet, I suppose, a comparatively late age. It's it, it's not all that uncommon, I suppose, because that that whole period, that decade after the war, wasn't a good period for poetry in Scotland or England or America, for that matter. It was a bad period. It was between two things: between the kind of romanticism of the war years and and what was going to become the angry young men in England and the, the beats in America and the you poets in Russia at the end of the fifties. And Donald McCabe, for instance, uh, his, the, the first book that, that he now really. Had is 1955 and, and uh, he had the same break between being writing a great deal when he was young and then not, almost nothing in, until until the middle 1950s well the book that became a second life and which was published by Edinburgh university press in, in 1968 uh, contained poems that were written uh, um, in, in the 1960s to me it was uh, important because it, it represented my work at that at that time to date in all its uh, variety so people could see that um, I was at almost at the same time in these early 60s, mid middle 60s, writing poems about Glasgow, science fiction poems, experimental concrete poems, and so on. Uh, it wasn't a question of moving from one to the other, they were all going on at the same time. So it was, to me, it seemed to give a good impression of what I felt at that time. It was a very uh, prolific and enjoyable period for writing. I think most of us benefit from trying at least to have a second life. And Eddie's second life was a second life in various respects. Edwin Morgan had been a closeted homosexual. To some extent, among his closest associates, this was an open secret. So a second life in that regard. It was a second life for Glasgow as the city reinvented itself yet again. He and I would disagree a little about the consequences of that. He, on the whole, was more in favor of what Glasgow did, driving a motorway through the city, sending its citizens to the peripheries of Glasgow and so on. But I think Eddie, as a connoisseur of modernity, was optimistic about what was likely to emerge from that. So a second life for his native city and a second life for Scotland. This was Edwin Morgan working out what Scotland could be, trying to create a country that was imaginatively viable in the hope that in due course, it would become an independent state that could sustain itself through its arts and through its politics. And so Second Life, the Second Life was a tremendously reverberant phase for Eddie and for those of us who loved him and loved his work. The title was deliberately chosen, as you say, uh, partly because of the, the actual poem called The Second Life, which was, uh, about me and also about Glasgow. I think I think I wanted to lay some stress on the fact that Glasgow at that time seemed to be having the chance of a second life after the rather run-down, shabby post-war period. Things were happening, and although people might disagree as to what kinds of new buildings were going up and so on, nevertheless, something was happening, and I thought that was important. So it, it was that, it was Glasgow, and it was also the fact that uh, after a long period of, of self-doubt and not writing very much or very well, I felt very confident about myself in, in writing. So it was, oh, and also the old phrase about life begins at 40, it, it fit in very neatly with, with that too. So I felt that it was a kind of second chance for me as well as for the city. It began to, to change uh, a lot in the late 1950s when so much was being demolished and, and so many new things appearing that I began to look at it in a much, much more careful kind of way and I had strong feelings about it. I, it's, it's hard to sort out these feelings. It wasn't any one thing. It was just that I found it now a very, very interesting place that I wanted to say something about. And um, it was sometimes in, in praise of the changes. At other times, it would be uh, not, not so sure that everything was going well. But I felt I had to say something about it. Meanwhile, 
I made the film myself largely because we couldn't have afforded to get anyone else to do it. I don't think of myself as being a distinguished director or a particularly talented presenter, but I did want to put myself at the disposal of, of Eddie. Some of the locations could have been better chosen. There was no time, there was no money to go to places that would have been more relevant. This would have been better filmed at night, I think, to capture that sense of, of light playing on the motorways. Eddie was much more in, uh, in favor of those than I would. I'm not sure that Macintosh would have loved them as much as Eddie believed he might have. Balconies were extremely important to Eddie. We have him perched here and we recorded uh, on his balcony, although the, the sound wasn't great. Balconies are half in and half out. Well, what a metaphor for Edwin Morgan, who lived a life half in and half out. And that sense of being neither one thing nor the other uh, was, was very prominent in Eddie's imagination. It is also said, Eddie was talking about um, reaching the age of 40, that at 40, every man, every person has to choose to go back or go forward. Eddie went defiantly, proudly, bravely forward. So far forward, he ended up in a science fictional future that he wished Scotland might one day be worthy of. And the, the sense of modernity that we have here, I would say compromised modernity. I talk about the moat or way, these moats that cut glass go off from itself. But everything that was modern, was potentially exciting for Edwin Morgan and his own poetry, modernist in places, experimental in places, traditional in others, would I think, had he not been Scottish, uh, could have earned him a Nobel Prize as he would have been well worthy of such an honor. His was a protean imagination. No other poet I can think of saw the world as variously as he did and his achievement as a translator, as a poet, as a critic, as a co-inventor of a new Scotland, I think would have made him a Nobel laureate that the world would have been glad to celebrate. You spent 33 years in university teaching. How did you enjoy the, the academic day job? Oh, I quite enjoyed it. Uh, after the initial adjustment, uh, being away in the army for quite a few years, it took quite a bit of adjustment to the, the new uh, academic surroundings, but I quite liked it. I quite liked the idea of having a, a regular job. It seemed to suit me temperamentally to have that. What kind of areas were you most interested in as a teacher here? Well, I did Milton, Milton's Paradise Lost, I did Wordsworth, but I also tried to introduce quite a bit of uh, modern literature and also Scottish literature, which weren't done very much before. And I quite enjoyed doing that. Did you I first came across Edwin Morgan when he visited the convent school that was across from our boys' Catholic school. Their school was much more progressive and enlightened, of course, as young women, they were much more mature than us. And he turned up wearing his white safari jacket and changed my life. There was life before Eddie and life after it. It wasn't just the quality of the poems he read, which were magnificent. It wasn't just this wonderful mixture in his character of shyness and confidence, um, a kind of headlong hesitancy. It was not only a charisma, but a charism. There was something of the secular saint about him. His way of affirming existence, his way of evincing how to live, not preaching about it, his way of showing us what it could be to be Scottish, showing us that multiplicity and variety and complexity and contradiction, the possibility of inhabiting the paradox that is Scotland, that all of this could be managed and managed superbly. This is what Edwin Morgan did that day in St. Margaret's Convent School in Paisley. Later, when I was working at Scottish Television, having returned to London, sitting opposite me every day was the son of Hugh McDermott. And Mike Grieve asked me, because Mike was a fan of my work, asked me to give him a selection of my poems. I hadn't published a book at that point, ostensibly so that he might could go off and have a look at them. In fact, he gave them to Edward Morgan, who sent me a 12-page response, unbeknownst to me, completely unwittingly, I found that I had this formative, incredibly helpful critique from a poet I intensely admired. And from that grew a friendship. We'd meet every couple of months or so for dinner, usually the ubiquitous chip. Eddie would have a gin and tonic. I could never persuade him to have a double. 
and we would have a delicious dinner, a great conversation, because he was a wonderful conversationalist for all his diffidence. He was not a man who was comfortable with parties or gatherings uh, much larger than, than two or three. And his favorite way of uh, socializing was tete a tete, I do. And those conversations were of great importance to me, not just because we talked about poetry, but because we talked about Scotland as it was evolving, Scotland as it was developing, and we, we shared our hopes. Our political outlooks were very similar, strongly left-wing. Neither of us would have used the word nationalist of ourselves. I'm a rationalist, not a nationalist. But we certainly wanted a Scotland that was self-determining, autonomous, taking decisions for itself, the whole idea of subsidiarity, bringing decision-making down to the lowest possible level. Scot Scotland was for Eddie a place that needed a rallying point, and his poetry was that rallying point. I've never waved a saltire in my life, and I will die without doing so. But my goodness, I rushed to the banner that was Edwin Morgan. And that friendship, I didn't want to foreground in this little film. I wanted the viewer to have as much of a chance of being Eddie's friend when watching it as I had had. And the only reason I appear is because when we looked at the footage, given how skimpy the coverage was, there wasn't enough footage to exclude myself. So a younger version of me appears in the film. I'm 61 now, I was 30 back then when it was made. And part of me is quite glad that in the end, in the cloisters, I, I found myself in the same frame as Eddie who had taught me at university, and I cannot say that he was the greatest university lecturer I ever encountered, but his lectures in substance and in style had something utterly idiosyncratic. And what I most vividly remember is not Milton, in fact, but the lectures he gave on T.S. Eliot and the portmanteau talk he gave about Scottish literature. And for a man as eminent as him, to give an account of contemporary Scottish poetry without mentioning his own contribution to it was, I thought, not only a feat of modesty, but a feat of genuine humility. The collection of your scrapbooks that Glasgow University uh, lodges mm. presents an extraordinary record of your interest over a, a very long period indeed. When did you begin collecting? Oh, I began in uh, 1931 when I was 11 and I pasted lots of things into little jotters. And when I was, I think, about 17, I gathered these together into one of the big books and this guy had gone from there and uh, I did it until about uh, 1966, I stopped then. Were you conscious that you were storing up uh, material that you were going later to use poetically or, or was it just a, a more straightforward chronicle? It was just, just, it was just a more straightforward desire to, to keep, keep things interested in me. No, I wasn't thinking of it as being a, a book that would have any connection at all, in fact, with my poetry. It probably does have, I'm sure it must have, but no, it was uh, just things that I felt had caught my eye and struck me in some kind of way and I wanted to bring them all together and to put them in, in these books. This is one which was, belongs mostly to the period before the war. It has a little bit of the war in it, but uh, the, the one that uh, sort of could be sent to follow on from that, if you like, is the one that I managed to put together during the war when I was in the army. As you can see, it's all held together by uh, bits of elastoplast. If all you do is read strawberries or one cigarette, you will have an intense, potentially life-changing experience. Those poems are that good. But I think Edwin Morgan has to be circumnavigated. You have to be willing to make a 360 degree journey around that extraordinary talent to have any sense of what Morgan amounts to. The scrapbooks are giddily gay. They are themselves, I think, a truly important work of art. Eddie should have gone to art school. I think would have been happier had he done so. Uh, he was all set to do it. And I think family pressure, the conventions of the time, the kind of school he attended prevented that. They are masterpieces of collage and not just page by page, but taken as an entirety. They tell us a lot about Eddie that he couldn't say at the time. Uh, the scrapbooks are pretty out uh, you get a strong sense of his longings, his secret desires, and the copiousness of his imagination. This is a man who was interested in everything to the power of 10.
and he had a great capacity for sharing that interest. And the scrapbooks, although initially private works, indeed secretive ones, in fact, give us much more than a clue to Edwin Morgan. They are tremendously revealing of who he was and, and who he wished as an artist to be. I think of him as being a genuinely protean artist. Scotland, in many ways, is a country that favours miniaturists. Of course, our landscapes are, are rugged. Uh, it is a land of intimate expanses. But Eddie was not by nature, I think, a miniaturist. Eddie was built on the scale of a Walt Whitman. Do I contradict myself? Very well, I contradict myself. And Whitman is the presiding figure of the second life. And that capacity to be lavishly large, indeed to be enormous, unignorably gigantic, was a, a huge, genuinely huge part of Edwin Morgan's poetic project. There are other poets who wrote magnificently. Sandy Moffat's painting gives us images of all of those uh, who were prestigious uh, at the time, but none of the people in that frame was built on the scale of Edwin Morgan. And scale, proportion, and perspective are essential to any understanding of this particular poet, because it all adds up. The scrapbooks were masterpieces of putting this with that, and allowing contrast and continuity to express more than the individual images could. I think the same is true of Ed, Eddie's work, the translations, the experimental poetry, the love lyrics, which are as good as the love lyrics by, written by any poet I can think of. The plays that he translated, that capacity to be virtuosically various, this is what stands out in the work of Edwin Morgan. He is seminally, crucially, a gay poet. And Scotland would not be the place it is now for gay people to live in had it not been for the life of this man and his example. And I understand why some people might want to read him mostly as a queer poet. And of course, anyone is entitled to do that. But I think his gayness is all the more exemplary and, and powerful if you locate it in the overall context, because the heroism it took to write that kind of poetry with this wonderfully concealed gender and the determination to keep going at a time when sex acts between men were illegal, the wonderful love affair he managed to have with someone who was a polar opposite in many ways, someone like me from an Irish Catholic background, Eddie's father was militantly, again, Catholics, but I think Eddie was drawn to us. There was never any frisson between Edwin and myself, but I think he found in Irish Catholic Scots an exuberance, an eloquence, an in-touchness with feeling, an openness, and a frivolity, a capacity for song, a way of seeing the world that was very different from the Calvinist Scotland in which he had grown up. And my first encounter with him, as it happens, was in a convent school across the road from the, the boys' school that I attended. When you look back, having attained the age of 70, and having now um, made a, a public pronouncement about your, your private feelings, do you wish that you had, you had done that earlier when you look back at those years of pain? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, and I think it would, probably would have been better, but it just seemed impossible at that time, just because of, of the nature of the, 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 the kind of uh, public attitude to all such things and, and the, the fact that my own upbringing had been so uh, so inhibiting. It just was, wasn't possible. But yes, I do wish it had been possible earlier on. Yeah. At 30, I thought life had passed me by, translated Beowulf for want of love. And one night stands in city centre lanes, they were dark in those days, were wild but bleak. Sidney Graham in London said, you know, I always thought so, kissed me on the cheek. And I translated Rilke's loneliness is like a rain, and week after week after week, strained to unbind myself, sweated to speak, 
you must be prepared to have surprises sprung on you by life and you must be able to take these in your stride if you possibly can and, and come through and uh, I would just have the hope that I'd be able to go on writing about the things that, that, that do happen, things which I can't really foresee at all, but which uh, I don't look forward to with, uh, with dismay. At 70, I thought I had come through, like parting a bead curtain in Port Side, to something that was shadowy before, figures and voices of late times that might be surprising yet. The beads clash faintly behind me as I go forward. No candlelight, please. Keep that for Europe. Switch the whole thing right on. When I go in, I want it bright. I want to catch whatever is there in full sight. When Eddie and I used to meet for dinner, later when I visited him in hospital, or when we talked in the care home in which he lived at the end of his life, we would always talk about sex. His was a very energetic sex life. The war in the Middle East was a venery riot. Lots of men who thought they were straight discovered they weren't. I think Eddie saw sexuality as existing in a continuum. I think he thought most of us could be anything. And that sense of regret that Eddie had, had so much to do with the social class into which he was born and the religious atmosphere of Scotland in the 1920s and 30s. Despite the regrets, however, I think his contribution to the liberation of Scotland was that of a resistance fighter. He didn't only free his fellow gays, he liberated us all. He allowed Scotland to claim the mature freedom it had been unwilling to accept. And his witness and solidarity, as well as his talent, brought that change about I edited um, 20 odd years ago, 30 years ago nearly, a book called Dream State, The New Scottish Poets. And I decided that Eddie's words about Scotland would provide us with our introduction. And he guided the other poets through that anthology. Many of those poets are people like myself that he had taken an interest in. And I would go so far as to say that no other artist imagined more thoroughly or more feasibly, a Scotland in which everyone could comfortably live. I would, I would want to pay him that compliment to his, his was the conception of a Scotland that I wanted to live in. Alistair Gray said we should live as if we were already in that socialist republic. I've lived my whole adult life like that. But Eddie's way of showing how soft and sweet and gentle and acceptingly different that Scotland could be. Well, he did more than every politician in Scotland to make sure that this could really happen. The Scotland I'm living in now, the Scotland in which I'm talking about a film I made in 1990, well, Eddie Morgan created that Scotland. And I thank him. <laughs>